Hi, I'm David Penn, Research Analyst with Finnovate. Thank you for joining us for our latest Finnovate webinar, The New C-Suite Challenge, The Rise of Customer Experience. As this year shapes up, more digital disruptors are poised to change the financial landscape. In the APAC region, we're seeing digital-first organizations harnessing the power of data to provide enhanced customer experiences to give themselves a competitive edge and to deliver timely, relevant offerings to their customers. Customer experience will become the currency of financial services organizations in the future and help determine how products are developed for an increasingly informed customer. Our experts will discuss how to fuel continuous innovation across divisions and teams, how to build data-driven initiatives within financial services organizations, and how organizations are working with fintechs to drive better experiences. Leading us in this conversation are Andrew Aho, he's Regional Director, Data Platforms with InterSystems, Elon Chua, he's Group CTO of Kananga Investment Bank, Freddie Lim, Co-Founder and Chief Investment Officer of StashAway, and Brad Scar, Chief Technical Officer of Yellowfin. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Great, great. Well, let's go ahead and get started. We've got a lot of topics to cover, a lot of questions to ask, and some insights to be uncovered. So we're very glad to have you all with us today, and let's go ahead and get right into it. And this first question is uh, directed in, uh, to you, Andrew. Talking about data, always a big topic in financial services and in technology, regardless of whatever region that we're talking about. But there's one conversation about data, and there's another conversation about smart data. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that latter concept of smart data and why it's so important. Sure. Well, thank you, David, and welcome to all. I'm I'm really thrilled to be part of this panel uh, on behalf of InterSystems and to have a chat about these these topics, including smart data in financial services. So, look, David, I think you are correct. Data is a hot topic, uh, and I think it will continue to be so for for some time. And the reason is simple and won't be news to anyone: is we are generating a lot of data more than ever. Um, I think you've all heard that stat. Roughly 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years alone. Um, so if you have a look at really what's happening today in capital markets with the influx of retail investors, volatility, trading volumes, I mean, those, those are just small examples of how much data is being created. Um, and really, you know, it talks to the headache that we're starting to see uh, and being part of for financial services. Um, just as we seem to get our head around one type of challenge, say, uh, unstructured data, you know, another one will will pop up its head if it's uh, AI ethics or privacy. And I think you can layer on top of this, you know, increasing customer expectations uh, for a better customer experience. Um, our executives expecting us to do far more with less. Um, competition, whether that's internally uh, for resources or externally, maybe from new market um, entrants who are more agile or don't have legacy to deal with. Um, so really, there's a lot of pressure on uh, financial services um, people and teams to be able to do more uh, in this environment. But to talk to your, your question, what does smart data mean? I'm, I, I tend to think of this really as the, the infrastructure around smart data. And maybe a, a good example is the smart car or the autonomous vehicle, you know, whereby data enters our organisation at, at point A and it needs to make its way to where it's needed. Um, needs to be used by those who are allowed to. Uh, it's got to be traceable. Um, it also needs to arrive clean, timely, and, and in a trustworthy fashion. So I think if you compare data to smart cars and autonomous vehicles, you can see we've got a huge challenge ahead, uh, given we've been driving cars for over 100 years. So I think um, this smart data concept and this challenge really applies to, to much more than the technology. There's also the organizational readiness, um, such as data literacy, data culture, um, these sorts of elements that can get in the way of being able to use data in an intelligent way. I mean, there's no point in having clean and smart data arriving on the desk of people if we're going to continue to rely on gut instinct. Um, and, I, and I think some of the opportunities here for us really um, you know, we can run a more efficient business, we can reduce the regulatory burden, we can improve the customer experience and their overall financial well-being. Um, and we should be able to identify more profitable products and be able to compete more effectively in the markets that we choose to. And when a new, new entrant arrives, we should be able to figure out what is the right path, uh, whether that's a partnership, acquisition, 
we deselect that market uh, or, or whatever the choice is. So to me, smart data is a whole range of things uh, covering technology um, and, and the business as well. Truly, and you can certainly see just from your explanation of it, how it can apply so directly to financial services, or the evolution of data can apply to financial services. I want to sort of operationalize that a little bit, maybe turn uh, to uh, to Elon and Freddie with this next question. Looking specifically how organizations are leveraging data to create new opportunities and, and points of difference and improve the customer experience. And I'm not sure if Elon or you, Freddie, would prefer to go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right, so um, as you know, Kananga is actually an investment bank that has been established for more than 40 years, right? So you can imagine how much data we've collected over time, uh, even before my time, right? And we're also known as a one-stop hub for a variety of uh, investment products, ranging from uh, stocks, which forms part of our equity booking business, um, like you rightfully pointed out earlier, the one that's rightfully um, currently riding the global wave of retail stock investment. Uh, we also have mutual funds from our wealth management subsidiary, um, catering to customers who are more risk adverse and prefer more stable and long-term investment product. Uh, we also have futures, by the way, right, which carries a wide range of derivatives, um, such as commodities, you have crude palm oil, you have tin, you have equity, you have the KLCI, and then you have the financial uh, derivative as well. So um, what we've done here is um, we've actually currently set up a data science team who actually is looking to three key areas, right? Number one, we are looking to building what we call a data hub, where we can consolidate uh, various silo databases within a group into a single reporting and analytical database, right? Uh, secondly, what the team will need to do is uh, subsequently to perform what we call data cleansing, right? uh, rubbish in, rubbish out. So to ensure that the data makes perfect sense uh, with no duplicates, uh, making sure it's accurate, solid data integrity and completeness. So um, the team is tasked to do that as well. And with that, actually, um, the third part, we are extending this data to business managers in return uh, in an easy to use, intuitive graphical dashboard and report so that then they can finally have a 360 degree view of their customers. So to answer the question, how does all that improve customer experience and you know, help us to create a more competitive advantage in industry. Now, to me personally, the very first step to a good customer experience is knowing your customers inside out, right? By knowing the types of investment portfolio that our customer has with us, um, for example, the size of their investment, um, their investment habits, such as um, the frequency of entering and exiting a position or a product, we can now truly understand a customer's investment and risk profile. And in fact, we would sometimes understand it better than them, and naturally it's our job to do so, right? Now, if we were to combine all the above insights, which were previously siloed into a common view, now guess what can happen next? We can now empower our workforce to actually tailor their investment advisors to suit a particular investment and risk profile. For example, we can do upselling. Now, in the equity broking business, we can now look into the possibility of expanding the portfolio via a more informed, say, contra or margin offering. Um, we can also do cross-selling. Now, when the market is too volatile, for example, and the investors are all holding back, we can now advise them to look into a medium and long-term product such as mutual funds, right? To sum it up, uh, the more data we collect and analyze, I think the better our chances are to improve our customers' experience with us. That makes a lot of sense. And it's great to hear you mention the issue of uh, silos. Because certainly whenever we talk about data, that is one of the first issues that comes up. It's dealing with the issue of, of, of data being siloed. Freddie, I wonder if you could respond to that question as well in terms of some of the things you all are doing to leverage data. Yeah, I was going to um, adopt the silo perspective because um, uh, we, we founded a company four, four and a half years ago. So we have a clean slate and it was the core founding employee, employees, uh, the, the, the core team, including the founders, uh, you can say today is evolved into the management team that initiated the, the, the collection, the creation of data, the synthesis of data. And so I felt that it was quite empowering from day one because um, from day one, we decided to track everything that goes through our app or the funnel. We call it the funnel from the time you see the app, logging in uh, to the next step and next steps and to uploading documents to actually uh, transferring the money or withdrawing the money. Every part of the funnel in the app, we have made a conscious effort from day one to uh, to track uh, outflow and inflows, to track conversion. 
And, and, and that I found from, uh, thank God for that, because uh, that helps us uh, try to convert uh, customers to fee paying customers. Uh, the withdrawal uh, rates would also tell you what, what went wrong. Is this, is this the market or, or is it the app? Is it the user interface? Um, so, so I find that having support at the top management level to have this data analytics that's going to feed into your, your management committee uh, meetings uh, as the dashboard uh, for management, as an insights gathering uh, tool, uh, that, that is really, really empowering, rather than as I've seen in traditional banking institution where it's quite silo because a lot of departments themselves or trading desks themselves start collecting data and you know then sharing between departments then people have a sense of ownership over certain things. And there's also compliance issues where sharing across certain silos uh, became a very difficult exercise. Unless you design it from day one, you have budgeted for compliance, audit trails, you have done all this, going the other way is just so much more difficult. Uh, I'll stop here, but I'll just throw that out there. Um, no, I think it's an excellent point that you make in terms of the, the advantages that you can have if you're starting, if you're starting fresh uh, relative to the challenges if you really do have to go in and do quite a quite a bit of excavation work. I'm not sure if there was anyone else who wanted to touch on on some of the challenges that they've interacted again uh, in terms of leveraging data. If that's something you, Brian, or Brad, sorry, or, or Andrew wanted to touch on before we move on. Yeah, um, well, just a couple of points uh, that I'd like to extend on. Um, mm -hmm. Really, in, in terms of getting a competitive advantage out of data, um, we kind of see that in two different ways at the moment. So we're seeing uh, you know, clients using that uh, to create or enhance existing sort of digital experiences or create new digital experiences and augmenting those experiences with additional data and insights directly to customers. But also we see the, the creation of that insight uh, and the deployment of that internal to organizations to the staff that are supporting that customer experience as well. So mm -hmm. both are in, important. Um, and sort of technically we're seeing sort of two, two themes that are, are quite new but, but emerging. The first is a theme around automation. Um, so, you know, the, there's limits on human capacity in terms of how much uh, data they can analyze, how many insights they can find manually. And what we're seeing more and more is um, customers starting to use or enterprises starting to use automation to actually uncover those insights. Whereas previously that used to be part of the, the data mining team, very expensive infrastructure and software. We're starting to see that democratized down through the organization uh, and that right. sort of happen automatically at, at all different levels. And the other thing we're starting to see is, is what's happening with those insights. So we're starting to see those insights embedded more directly into line of business applications, either directly with the customer uh, mm -hmm. or into line of business applications that staff are using. So rather than having to switch out from one application into their dashboard application, those insights are being embedded directly into the applications that they're using and they're, they're there directly at that point. Um, so there's just a couple of things as well. I'd, I'd definitely add to that, um, you know, Brad. I think the um, smart data, if we, you know, to, to pull on that thread again, um, it needs to be at the fingertips of the people when they need it. It's not, there's no point having it but not making it available. Um, but I think just more broadly, in terms of attitudes and approaches, um, we, we've done some work in in open banking, and that can be quite a threat for an established business when you think about, you know, the competitive landscape and, you know, I want to hold on to my data. And uh, I think, you know, sort of refreshingly, we've been seeing, you know, the attitude changing to, well, look, I'm going to have to do this anyway. So how do I make this a better experience for my customer? And in doing so, can I retain them longer? And maybe I might even think about using the platform to integrate with other services and improve their financial uh, outcomes as part of this thing that I'm you know, pretty well being forced or pressured uh, to do. Excellent. You can truly see from the from the conversation, certainly from the things that I'm getting, is that you just see the centrality of the customer experience to, to, to everything, to the challenge of data and data siloing, to the rise of automation with regard to, to business processes and, and so forth. And of course, the idea of embeddedness in terms of financing, making that a much more seamless process for the consumer, something that they're they're anticipating. And it just is it's just a reminder of just how critical I think this all of these uh, threads are when they come together. Um, I want to stay with you, Andrew, uh, in this next question, and maybe we can again go around the around the room 
uh, to, to address it. And it looks again specifically at the financial sector and sort of where you think they are as a sector in terms of realizing that potential of, of, of data and then utilizing it to drive decisions that are actually providing improved financial outcomes for their customers. Both Freddie and Elon have mentioned a few things, but I'm curious from your sort of maybe a high uh, 360 foot view uh, of it, where do you see the financial sector right now? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I think, um, you know, it'll be very interesting to hear from uh, Freddie and Elong from their, um, you know, their own examples in, in the thick of things right now. But as you said, we get a bit of a, a different view being across a, a large number of organisations. And I think in general, we're in relatively good shape. Um, obviously, some are doing better than others. And, and Freddie's example is certainly one of disruption um, with Stashaway, where you know th there is a real use of data. There's a strategy that's been there since day one, and competitive advantage is being delivered because of you know these these very deliberate decisions about how you utilise data and, and information. Um, but I think you know ongoing um, as we get more and more into to some of the things that. Um, Elon talked about, uh, and Brad as well, being able to deliver more holistic and personalised financial services. I mean, you really need to get to uh, a higher quality of, of data, um, clean, trustworthy, timely and accurate. Um, and also there's the organisational change uh, behind that. I think there was a mention before about, you know, with the silos, can you get more than one division to work with the others? Um, and, and, and more and more uh, being able to deliver these holistic and highly personalised or uh, personalised or hyper-personalised uh, financial services requires those departments and divisions to, to come together to solve a problem. Um, look, we have plenty of examples, I think, where we can, we can talk to this, um, uh, things working really well. But one uh, I, I felt was very interesting from the point of view that it was a negative um, uh, beginning. It was a negative jolt, if you like, where we were looking at uh, customer churn and a project to really predict uh, customer churn in this organisation. So really it was coming from the point of view that the consumer no longer wants or needs your service. Um, uh, how do we uh, figure out whether or not we can retain them and how do you do that? But the outcomes were actually both pretty interesting. The uh, we, we, we were able to figure out how to predict fairly reliably um, potential missed payments. Uh, or distress, and uh, when uh, the bank went about actually doing something about it in a proactive manner, that really um, endeared the customer to want to work uh, more closely with the bank. It was a very, um, you know, it uplifted the customer experience. Um, and I think also, which was useful from our side, uh, when you prove that you can bring these different groups of people together to solve, you know, what was perceived as being a negative problem, actually the, the outcomes for the bank in terms of uh, the data strategy and, and breaking down silos and crossing um, departments was all, uh, you know, a very, um, a very positive thing. So, um, look, I think there's, uh, I, th I think we're, we're doing okay, but there's certainly uh, room to improve. And uh, what I would hope is that we can improve before we're forced to, because ultimately with these sorts of changes, um, and agile, uh, more agile partners coming into uh, competitors coming into the ecosystem uh, very quickly. We can we can find ourselves on the outside of, of customer experience and satisfaction. Yeah, David, you're on mute. Yep. My apologies. Yeah, I was saying that that it's in this past year we've certainly all come. Very, uh, very much aware with the idea of being forced to change. Um, so that's certainly something I think that if nothing else, we we're heightened to the possibility that that is something that's going to be coming down the pipe um, when we least expect it. I wonder if we could take up that uh, that idea a little bit more uh, with the room in terms of uh, sort of your perspectives on just how far down the path either your own organization or the organizations that you are affiliated with are in terms of really putting data to the uses that it can be put. Yeah, um, yeah, maybe I'll just take that on, yeah. Please. So um, let's let's first ask ourselves, right? Um, when was the last time we actually stepped into the bank, uh, besides the need to go to an ATM machine and withdraw cash? And with COVID-19, I think the preference method to pay has definitely switched from um, pieces of notes that changes hands, you know, a few hundred times, imagine that, right? To that of contactless payment like uh, QR codes and pay waves. 
Um, secondly, I think the definition of financial services is getting really blurry right now. Uh, most of us will have heard about digital bank licenses that many countries, uh, central banks are doling out right now, right? For example, in Singapore, you have the Monetary Authority of Singapore um, granting digital full license banks to a few companies. Now, you would think that, oh, okay, um, are they giving to the traditional banks, right? But um, guess not, it's, uh, uh, guess what, it's not, right? Um, here are some of them. For example, um, you have one given to tech giant SEA, which actually owns Shopee and a game developer called Garina, right? The second license goes to uh, Grab and Singtel on a 60 and 40 basis. Uh, which one is specializing in right healing while the other one is a telecommunications company then um, you have razor youth bank uh, consortium of sorts where they have insurance companies in there automotive and tech firms uh, with razor fintech own, owning 60 percent of that consortium and then the last one is like beyond consortium uh, led by osim founder and payments company easylink for the mrt payment and property developers such as um, faris, faris organization so it, it is not no longer uh, you know uh, a world where hey you have the traditional banks playing in this uh, financial services field in hong kong you have almost the same thing but uh, without having to list all of them um, when the hong kong monetary authority actually gave out the licenses to eight virtual banks uh, the headline that came out read uh, hkma hopes to promote fintech uh, innovation and cx with eight new virtual banks so the, the key messages about cx is there now, in home ground Malaysia itself, uh, Bank Negara Malaysia has indicated recently that uh, there are actually 40 parties that have registered their interest to apply for a digital bank license. Imagine that 40, right? Uh, the last I counted, we don't have so many banks in Malaysia. So uh, I think if CX is indeed the new currency for financial um, services industry, um, by the way, which I thought the new uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is the new currency, but apparently not, right? But let's not go there, right? Um, and let's say if data powers uh, customer experience by either allowing better products to be built for the customers or down to something as simple as great customer service, then I think the amount of quality data that you have and the speed of collecting those data now becomes key factors to remain relevant and competitive in the industry. Right? If we look at the equation again, there are many non-FI organizations out there that has more data points compared to an FI and more customer base that are already consuming products or services from them on a regular basis. Why is the scale then tilted towards them, right? Well, it's because they probably have, uh, they, they are able to project a much more detailed and in-depth uh, customer demographics. Now, for traditional retail banks, I believe that the unseen threat is rather real. Uh, we're looking at a few factors that could really tip the scale. One, um, understanding how the new generation would like to perform their banking transactions. They're different, right? Uh, they don't like to go to banks and so on. Um, from getting a loan to investing their income, maybe. Uh, two, we can see that digital players who came into the industry without proper channels or legacy systems that will actually make the work of data mining, uh, data ingestion and data presentation much less complicated, right? Um, and thirdly, uh, with non-FI players who aspire to compete in the FI space via re, um, existing and proven payment methods, um, such as e-wallets, it's really everywhere, right? That already commands a huge customer database, and that itself has lowered the entry barrier to compete. Of course, I think the next challenge is to build a data-driven organization or culture. As we know, uh, many FIs have been operating based on um, dumb data as opposed to smart data, right? by merely putting together tons of data in spreadsheets and then um, they're going to display them in nice colorful charts um, but that can only do so much for a human manager to consume right and then uh, make informed decisions out of it it is largely currently dependent on having a veteran that has many years of experience in the industry to decipher those data uh, not discounting that experience does matter imagine what smart data can do for the very same person um, let's recall briefly the definition of smart data, right? I would say it's data from which signals and patterns have been extracted by intelligent algorithms. Uh, maybe data that has been processed and is waiting to be turned into actionable information, right? So to summarize all of that, I think uh, moving forward in the next three to five years, I believe there will be an increasing trend of FIs, large and small, to adopt business intelligence and data analytics solutions to a certain extent. Now, their hand is being forced to do so in order not to just thrive, but to survive in a new playing field, right? 
In this new arena, the financial services pie is being shared by non-FIs, which are already, they already have a great following of loyal customers who are ready to consume a more simplified and digital financial services uh, from them. Absolutely. I'm curious, uh, before we move on, if uh, either you, Freddie, or Brad had something you wanted to add to that idea in terms of your sense of where the financial industry is with regard to its capacity or its, its proven ability so far, at least, to make good use of data. Uh, David, um, you said that uh, how far down the path are we? Um, and I think the path keeps growing and it keeps getting longer. Um, so, sure. and, I, and I don't think we'll ever get to the end of it. So, you know, I started doing this 25 years ago. Uh, when data warehouses were just becoming a thing and business intelligence, and it felt like we were, you know, we had this enormous mountain to climb and we're about a third of the way up. And mm -hmm. it's 25 years on, it feels like maybe we're still a third of the way up, but we're, <laughs> the mountain is much bigger, right? And, and things have gotten uh, drastically more complicated, volume, complexity, regulation, um, expectations of customers, competitive intensity, and new entrants and so forth. So I don't think it's something that we ever get to the end of. Um, it always feels like the, the challenge is still very large and insurmountable, but um, I think we should also note the progress that has been made um, in, you know, in recent decades as well to get to where we are today. Um, and I think, you know, in 25 years time, we'll probably still feel like we're in the same place, but we'll again have improved, you know, uh, by a large quantum. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Freddie? Um, I, I would say um, there's been a lot of progress, but data in the integration has always been um, challenging, especially with a traditional institution is, is massive with a lot of different departments and businesses and sometimes what data can actually be shared, what cannot be. The show volume itself makes it very difficult to decipher. Um, I think there's, there are technology, technological innovations that can help address this, which is in the, in the area of semantics. Uh, on, on topology where instead of uh, trying to force integration of data across the silos, you only allow people to access certain part of data through a smarter way to search for the data. You By mm -hmm. typing a certain semantics, typing a certain attribute, and getting that request uh, through an API, getting the request over and then somebody else approved the access and you are able to just draw from a little bit of from that, that pipeline of data that's relevant for you, that smart approach is probably better at the today's level in, in today's regulatory environment than to force a full data integration and enhance risk it with the regulators. So I just want to add a different dimension to that uh, discussion so far. Yeah. yeah, and let's actually follow up on that, that, that aspect. I mean, one of the questions that I, I think a lot of people have is, or what are some of the challenges, uh, obstacles uh, that financial service organizations face as they're trying to do some of this? And we've talked about some of the issues internally with culture, with, with silos, externally with the threat or the challenge, maybe we just say from big tech or from tech fin, however you want to, however you want to refer to it. But I maybe thought that we could sort of go around again and take a look at that aspect. What are some of the major things that are making it difficult financial services do these things that we all sort of agree they need to do. And we all sort of have a sense that they know that they need to do. Uh, but there are these challenges. And, and, and but Brad, maybe we could start with you in terms of what you think some of these challenges might be for, for financial service organizations. Yeah, I think one for me, you know, I think we, we've sort of covered a lot of the challenges, you know, that, that, that everybody knows about complexity mm -hmm. and, and volume and so forth. But one of the things uh, when I when I think about when I first started working in banking and, and, and now, a, a, a lot of things feel very much the same. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, the technology environment has changed very rapidly. You know, many things are different. But one of the things that the same is the same for me is is people. And I think fundamentally the human aspect uh, and how the humans in this process behave is something that, that perhaps hasn't shifted enough. Um, people are still interacting with data in, you know, in very similar ways to what they were, you know, 25 years ago. They're still reading reports or drilling down on a chart, you know, it's the same sort of interaction. And there's still a large number of people that just don't want to engage with data in that way. Um, mm -hmm. They don't have the time, they don't have the skill, you know, they, don't, they can't, in, you know, to, to interpret, you know, a trellis chart or something like that, uh, let alone to, to, to put that in the context of their business. Um, or they just simply don't have the inclination and they don't want to do it. Um, and I think, so that, that human element has been really stubborn. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why, you know, adoption rates of, of data in organizations really hasn't got to where it needs to be. And I think, you know, this day and age, we need to sort of take 
some different approaches in looking at that problem and, and think differently about that. Uh, and particularly looking in detail about he, how people want to consume data, um, uh, using automation more smartly to deliver relevant personalized insights, uh, embedding uh, the analytics in, into the workflow that the people are already doing, um, uh, you know, and creating new sort of multi-experience ways of delivering that data um, that are more suitable to, to those audiences. So I just wanted mm -hmm. to sort of add that human aspect to it as well. I think that's excellent. I appreciate your framing as well, the idea of some of the things that maybe we haven't talked about as much, the less obvious challenges. Are there any uh, other less obvious challenges out there that uh, anyone else from the panel thinks or might be worth underscoring? I, I think Freddie added something earlier, which was having that executive support really from the get-go. Um, mm. It's not um, there's a lot of things that you can do without, you know, the best technology in the world, you know, access to a lot of people, um, a really well thought out data governance strategy and the rest of it. They're all things that you would need to have, but, you know, they don't need to be the Rolls Royce. But if you, if you don't have executive support, and it could be as simple as, you know, executive support that says, I'm going to give you and your team enough time and space to deal with this, um, um, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that, that can be missing that can really create big problems uh, for success. And so, you know, numbers of examples, but one that always sticks in my mind is when we're on a proof of concept and the, um, the team we're working with gets dragged away to, for, for run the bank activities. And that, that is always going to happen. It's always been the case. But, you know, I, I kind of think that always hinders and slows down the ability to actually do some of the innovative things that that people really want sure. to get on and do so um, i don't know that there's a good answer but I, I agree with freddie i don't think you can do without it freddie are you on other ideas of challenges um i yeah i i mean um i think the biggest challenge is, uh, as brad has said is uh people because they they can feel threatened uh, or insecure about their jobs when when the organization is in this transitionary phase, moving to a fully data-driven firm, but before you get there, it's, it's actually a lot of fear uh, internally. Uh, that, that we have to acknowledge that, and I think management needs to acknowledge that. And although you take initiative, you've got to do it in a very um, measured and more human manner uh, to, to, to gradually get people along with you. Um, after all, alignment of the whole organization is is key, uh, where you maximize this value. Um, so I, I would I, I would say that um, there's so many. I have a whole list here, but you know I find I was just looking at it and it felt like that's the most important one. Like I, I look at some survey, lack of leadership support, number one, company cult, number two, company culture, wow. number three, okay. lack of integration, number four, regulatory requirements five silos, six data security, seven data quality, eight lack of talent slash experience. Um, so that there's so many, but I think the people factor, tra tra uh, you know, traverses everything else, so. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think one of the things also I wanted to talk a little bit about, we talked about some of the different technologies that can make it possible. Obviously, you've got to have the people first, but there are certain technologies that can, can help enable that AI, analytics we discussed. And I guess what I'm curious about is, will this lead to a really hyper-personalized future in terms of product development? Will these tools be able to get us to, assuming we've got the people on board, will these tools enable us to get to where we want to with, with hyper-personalization? And if not, what else needs to be put in the, in the toolkit? And maybe, Andrew, we could start with, with you from that, uh, from that perspective. Yep, sure, thank you. And I don't know if, if it's a problem or not, but the smart lighting behind me just went out. So <laughs> uh, I'll continue on anyway. Uh, yeah, look, uh, absolutely, uh, David. I, th I think hyper-personalization is not something that's that's coming. It already exists in, in our world. Um, and I've got a somewhat tangential example, but you know, recently, uh, due to factors I won't go into, I actually explored using a different search engine, one that didn't have my history and, and that wasn't maybe quite so concerned about my, my privacy, you might say. Um, and I, I got to say, the, uh, the experience was, was quite confronting. So I found myself using more uh, energy and time to find the things I was seeking. Um, mm. And that just really spoke to me about, well, this, I'm working with a product that is hyper-personalized here. 
and to go and shift, you know, is it really worth all the concerns that I've been told about or that I might really believe in, in terms of that experience, which is just so much better. Now, I'm not going to link the search engine to Elong's business, but but he said that before, which is, you know, sometimes we need that um, and the human decision making can be taken out to deliver a much better experience and a much better financial outcome. So I, I really do believe that hyper-personalization is, is, is something that, that will help us and there's lots of things we'll have to get over in terms of fear and, and privacy and so on and, and, and control, but um, ultimately there can be a really good outcome and a really good experience. Um, and to go into the technology just for a moment, whether or not you call it a data hub or a data fabric, um, you know, which tends to be our language a bit more, the data fabric, smart data fabric, um, it, it doesn't really matter that much. The idea is that you've got to get that data to, and lots of data, it's got to be clean, good quality, trustworthy. It's got to be there and available so that you can perform the analysis to be able to deliver that hyper-personalized experience. Um, and quite often that, you know, Brad, I hope we've moved on from 25 years ago, but it doesn't mean creating another data warehouse, which is going to be a silo. It might mean tapping into data that already exists or is in flight and, and using that or reusing that rather than having to replace or rebuild. Absolutely. Any other thoughts on, on the role of, of hyper-personalization? Do we sort of concur that it's sort of here and just continuing to manifest itself? Um, if you look at the a lot of the consumer surveys, um, one thing that's emerging as a super trend uh, for consumers is personalization. Uh, I don't think we are at a stage where everybody can do uh, hyper personalization, but everybody wants to try to personalize uh, their apps or platforms more uh, because of this super trend. Um, so for us as well as a robo investing platform, we also have to ask the same questions. Um, like because we have a dilemma in my case, I, so I, I, I'll be honest about this in that our DNA is, is about, you know, the certain key principles we, we follow when we build portfolios for customers. But when you personalize it too much, what is the track record of the fund manager? Uh, is it in the best interest in terms of risk adjusted performance for, for the user? Because personalization means the user chooses based on other metrics that may or may not be in their best interest. It could be just a desire to do something cool, it, but it may not be the right thing to do uh, long term, right? So that's always a dilemmatic situation for uh, a digital wealth manager, even like ourselves. And um, and uh, however, for a brokerage platform or, or some sort of a fund supermarket type uh, uh, platform, it's very natural to, to make it ever more uh, personalized uh, on that super trend. It's, a lot easier. So I think I'm. I hope I'm also. I will throw it to Elon as well because I. I don't know if he sees the same problem with that. But um, I have a dilemma here. <laughs> can, can you help us out, Elon? Yeah, I, I think um, it's going to be a hybrid between um, automation and a personal touch to it, right? So probably we are looking at addressing um, two very distinct um, types of customer here. If I could just generalize. Um, if, if today um, I'm part of a, a different generation and I want to invest a thousand ringgit a month, let's say, right, or to that to that tone of five thousand, maybe even ten thousand, I, I wouldn't really mind not speaking to anyone. Uh, I'll, I'll just go to an app, look at robo advisors, look at how AI is spewing out some of the you know the, the assessment for me, and I'll just throw the money in and say I'll just wait for the returns, right? No big deal. Um, in the event I, want to, I really want to speak to someone, I probably wouldn't even want to leave out my phone. I'll probably hope that there's some sort of messaging platform that I can type and get a response to, right? Now, if you were to look at the other spectrum where I'm, I'm now a millionaire, I'm a billionaire, right? I'm about to invest 10 million ringgit or US dollar uh, into somewhere. Am I really sure I'm going to go to an app and say, all right, transfer one, you know, 10 million ringgit into that application to manage for me? Or am I better off saying that, hey, hang on a second, I remember this guy, um, great guy, you know, made a lot of money for me. Should I give him a call and, you know, have tea with him, have coffee with him, have lunch with him and say, you know what, I'm about to put in 10 million ringgit into this fund or, or this, this counter. What do you think, right? Now, although the fund manager could be assisted by AI uh, in, at the back end, right, looking at charts and, and portfolio and what's not, uh, data analytics, and then telling 
this millionaire and billionaire the same recommendation that he or she would have gotten if he or she would have gotten into the app and just say, hey, 10 million ringgit, where do I put it? The AI will tell him here. And then now it's just through the word of a person to say, I think you put it here and this is why, right? It sort of makes the experience much, much better, right? More credibility is built uh, through that conversation. Uh, of course, there's no guarantee in life, right? Um, either the AI or the human can make the same mistake. But with that, I think it, it sort of then uh, synchronizes the need for a person to have a personal touch before investing a large amount of money. Yeah, absolutely. I can't help but wonder if in, in some respects hybrid will be one of the, the, the buzzwords of, of 2021. We see it in so many different instances, the idea of the, the sort of a, a COVID lockdown economy and then the economy when we get back out, what's it going to be like? And increasingly people think it's probably going to be a hybrid, not one or the other. And then some of the remarks that you're making that at the end of the day, it's not going to be all digital or all human, it's going to be some uh, culling of, of the best of both worlds if we're lucky um, and, and in both of those. Um, sort of by way of wrapping up this conversation, part of it before maybe we talk uh, about some questions, um, I thought maybe we could sort of look at the, the role of product owners and how that role will change over the next few years as financial services evolve, begin to incorporate some of the insights that you all have discussed. From the point of view of those who are product owners, how do you see that uh, that role changing, and I'd like to open that up to uh, to everyone if you could. Well, maybe I can start. Um, I think in, in in Australia, and I, I can't speak for the rest of the region, but I expect it's probably very much the same. Is mm -hmm. that there's there's not a lot of differentiation in fin financial services anymore um, at the consumer level. Um, especially from the legacy financial service services providers uh, and perhaps at the business product level as well. And for the most part, I can go to any one of the major banks in Australia and get pretty much the identical product with identical features, uh, maybe a few basis points different. So I think for me, the, the, one of the key things for product owners is how are they going to find that differentiation and, and uh, you know, what means are they going to have at their disposal uh, to be able to create that differentiation? And you know, probably you know, one of the last um, you know areas, or one of the few areas that they can find that is through differentiating on experience. Um, and I, and I, as everything else becomes a more homogenous, that becomes a differentiator. Um, and I think that you know, uh, to to the topic tonight, that you know, data is one of the one of the things that that all you know, many of those organisations have at their disposal, uh, and how they can apply that intelligence intelligently um, to create that differentiation is, is um, going to be one of the key challenges for product owners going forwards. Absolutely. Yeah. Further thoughts? Um, I think um, uh, the product owner must think of um, his or her role as a, a general manager of a football team because, right. yes, um, it's a bit like money ball because to know the health or progresses or rate of change of how you're progressing as a team, you need to first collect data and measure your progress. You, you, you need to measure, you need data. Um, and you then also, as a general manager, you need to analyze the data and you need analytics, you need tools, you need to make informed decisions. And it's not just about your team's progress over time, you also need to compete. So you need to analyze the competitive landscape as well. If you don't, somebody else would do it. So I think there's no choice here. They really will be forced to become more, um, more measure, more measurements, uh, more, more, more analytics. And uh, having said that, the biggest challenge for product owners is that once you have all that in place, how do you convert that to value? How do you convert mm -hmm. that to support from top management? Unless the company culture is essentially top down on data, you will find it like uphill battle, like a marathon as well, because ultimately you need a support. You saw a trend in the data. There's an opportunity here, but it's the uphill battle to talk to someone up there to, to understand this, then nothing happens, competitor does it. So the role of product manager is a lot more challenging than before. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, other thoughts on the role or the evolving role, we should say, of, of the product owner in this, in this landscape of, of increasingly smart data and increasingly engaged financial services companies? Uh, I don't have a lot more to add there. I, I think it really is going to have to be data driven. And I love the Moneyball uh, reference. I think that's uh, that's spot on. As I said before, you know, you've got decisions to make about which markets you operate in and how you operate, whether you are 
in it with a product you own, whether you partner, uh, whether you acquire. Um, and I think, you know, those are big decisions that can be made really well utilising data and maybe even to, to build out a scenario where you try one or two to understand the market better and then move into full um, deployment of your own product. So I think it is it's a very important um, evolving role. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the questions that we've we've got sort of by way of, of wrapping up. Some of them touch on some of the things that we've that we've talked about. Some of them maybe extend them a, a little bit, um, but sort of maybe way of uh, hammering home maybe some key points from uh, from the conversation that we, we've had. Uh, one of the main questions was, how does an organization actually make this shift from being data generating to being data driven? What is sort of the it was involved, I guess, is, is the most fundamental question. And I'm not sure who would want to first tackle that one. Uh, I can just quickly say that the example I gave before, and sorry, Elon, I know you're trying to jump in there. The example I gave before about a about customer churn, um, if if it's uh, if it's unfortunately a negative uh, jolt, something that's really creating a problem, a pain, quite often that's enough, and that's a good way to get the the support and the uh, the, yeah. the the resources that you need. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully you can find other ways to to garner that support because there's lots of good reasons to do that. Uh, but failing that, I think you know, try and find the big ugly problem and and work on that with a with a way to to resolve it. Elon. Yep. Um. I I think it's by taking the very first step of helping business or users um with any obvious challenges that they currently have with regards to data, right? Because you want you want to do you want to transition the mind mindset shift here. Um. Some of the initial efforts might be downright mundane. It's very boring for us to do, right? But we must first remember that most of our audiences are not very technical, nor were they trained um, by profession as a data scientist. So in order for us to sell them the idea of how uh, eventually AI or ML could actually help them in providing data insights, uh, may not be the very, um, you know. So it is like telling people, hey, you know, that you can fly before showing them the first flying machine. They wouldn't. They are not going to believe you, right? So I personally think that by doing proof of concepts that are relatively easy for the data science team to execute, um, but yet demonstrate a huge amount of automation and goodwill to the businesses, that will actually pave the way for subsequent conversations that will lead um, the organization to eventually become data driven. David, I think there's a there's also a maybe a very simple approach, and that is just. Um, Whenever you're looking at a at a business, any business process, whether it's customer facing process or a back end process, is just simply asking the question, uh, which is, what insight could I possess right now that would make this process more effective? And mm -hmm. I, and I, and and I think so. It's in part about creating the demand and creating the curiosity as well, um, which is going to actually then lead to the answers and 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 leveraging of the data that com many companies already have. Sure, sure, it makes a lot of sense. I'm curious if there are stories, and I know you've talked on some instances and, and iterations of this, but are there any particular stories of, of, of data applications being used to en enhance the customer experience? Do you think are particularly telling, particularly interesting, or maybe even just something that uh, people might not have thought of uh, until you uh, confronted it yourself? Are there any things that fall into those categories that we could share? So if you're um, nodding heads, let, right? let, me, let me make an attempt then. <laughs> um, we, we've seen COVID-19's um, impact on markets and, and we are fund managers, so our, our users are exposed to market swings. So we have a program in place where if a particular account for consecutive, consecutive days has lost more than X amount of money versus their risk tolerances, uh, we have an automated email campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. They will dish out data-driven evidences of trying to promote the right principles like oh, people who, who, who react to the very short term blips, they tend to lose out in uh, over the medium and long term, show actual data that we can uh, collect uh, and share those insights. Uh, I, I think uh, that's one example. It's a small example, but I'm sure the panelists have other big, uh, big examples as well, but I just thought it, to throw this out there. That's an excellent one, certainly given uh, this sort of GameStop Robin Hood era. Um, having that kind of reminder of what's going on in your account is is very timely as well as very helpful for sure. Um, any other examples, uh, the similar or or more uh, more general about that, that you've come come across of of data really being put to some innovative uses 
to enhance the customer experience that you could uh, that you could share. You know, maybe just another small example for me then, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, sure. A very simple success story from my previous life, not the current one, right? Uh, I was in the general insurance industry um, where we have, we have actually studied claims data uh, to improve customer experience. Uh, mm. We actually realized that about 80 to 90 percent of non-commercial vehicle claims were mostly approved um, upon verification from our claim adjusters, right? Um, therefore, we actually redesigned the claim process to be a bit more seamless in the sense that uh, once you have driven your or towed your semi-damaged vehicle into an authorized workshop um, by the panel insurer, the workshop will actually be empowered to start the repair or parts replacement process uh, upon validating that your motor vehicle insurance is still valid, right? So uh, with that, that dramatically reduced the repair start time from a few days uh, where you need a human to validate, the, you know, to just within a matter of one hour, one to two hours, they can actually start the process. You know, that, that, that's a good example. You think of the kind of thing the person goes through in that moment, their, their whole pattern has been disrupted and getting them back on their normal pattern of where they need to go and being able to go there as quickly as possible is a major, major customer experience differential as opposed to standing around, waiting, calling, that kind of thing. I think it's a, it's a fantastic example. Um, I had another question I thought that was, was uh, uh, sort of an interesting one also it has to do with this idea of adopting uh, this, this sort of uh, uh, these technologies. And this has to do with the idea of costs. And then you're balancing upfront costs of legacy infrastructure to make it easier to uh, take advantage of some of these data insights. And I thought maybe with uh, uh, sort of time running up here, maybe we can sort of finish with that one. What are some of the advice that you would give to manage that upfront cost for some of these uh, companies that see that as a primary obstacle? I, I, I would say very simply, um, it's not always rip and replace. I mean, there are technologies like into systems that can allow you to coexist um, with your existing infrastructure um, that allow you to create more value from the data source and the data silos that you already have and the applications which you might consider legacy. Um, so it's not necessarily a you know big behemoth replace um, and put in a new all singing, all dancing system. There's a way to, to do this over time and to take incremental steps where you can demonstrate value and get more um, buy-in and support for your overall program. Well, um, I, I, I often heard from uh, the, the, the term uh, tech debt. So it's uh, basically as you grow and you haven't go back and fix some holes or gaps in your uh, systems or you are stuck with your legacy systems. Or worse, a lot of institutions have stuck with a number of legacy systems. Um, then the problem gets larger as platforms are changing outside the world anyway. Um, so compatibility of legal systems to the outside world, that will become a bigger problem. So it, it is a difficult one because management has to think about it as a forward-looking thing rather than uh, like-for-like re replacement today. Um, and like, for example, I've, uh, I, I, can't, I, I wouldn't name anyone, but there's an organization where they have a billion dollars of uh, technology budget a year, a bank, and 80% of it went to maintaining legacy systems or forcing Legacy, legacy systems to continue to work. And yeah. it's becoming more and more cumbersome with human labor with the system to try to make them work. So that cost can be analyzed as a trend because that budget has been growing, but none of it has been going to new developments or no one dares to make that effort to replace it entirely. Starting from scratch sometimes is actually the best way to move forward. So you design it to, to be the way you want. Uh, not constrained, but that, that requires a lot of willpower all the way from the top, all right? So it requires a certain entrepreneurial spirit uh, to change your organization into the second wave. I, I don't think there's any other easy answer. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe just to wrap up, it, to, to finish, we've talked and it's come up a number of times, the idea of culture, leadership, and so forth. And I wonder if any of you have any just general thoughts about that end of, of, of the puzzle, of what, what it takes on those companies' parts in order to make some of these things happen in terms of leadership. Are we talking all the way at the senior, senior top, or are we talking middle leadership as well? Personally, I think it has to start at the very top uh, with the CEO and, and with the leadership team and, uh, and the, the behaviors that are expected in the organization need to be modeled there. And, and that's what our CEO does. We always have you know, discussions on the basis of fact, and there's always data and, and so forth. And but but I would I would caution also against creating mandates 
Um, so I've worked mm. in organizations where there's been mandates to use data and everyone must have three key metrics or, you know, produce a dashboard every week. And I, I, I tend to see when that, when that happens that people go through the motions and they're not really, you know, mm. fully vested in, in, in the idea of that process. So it has to be something where it's led by example, but it's actually, um, you know, it's authentic and, and it's, and that's actually truly adding value. Sure, sure. It's got to be real leadership, basically. It's not just a not just a metric, not just a, a ruler. Uh, any any other thoughts on, on on that before we close on that idea of culture and leadership from the companies that have, have made it work, perhaps? Um, don't have the answer. Um, just a sharing that I, I think um, Brett is right that leadership teams need to set the example of success with data driven decisions and leadership has to make the example of not making decision based on re just relationships or personal preferences right but that there's always evidence-based uh, decision making at the top and that will naturally proliferate within the organization where people try to in everything they do or when they present to the management they would try to back it up with uh, the, the database that they already have um, i think it really starts by setting examples not a mandate Absolutely. Excellent. Well, it's final thank you all for a very fascinating conversation. We're about running out of time, so I want to get and, and end it before things end abruptly for us. Uh, I want to thank our guests, Andrew, uh, Elong, Freddie, and Brad, for some very, very insightful comments on the customer experience, something that, again, was a huge a deal in 2019 was important in 2020 in a way we hadn't expected and it's certainly going to be something that we're all going to be keeping our eyes on on 2021 as this year unfolds thank you gentlemen again for a fascinating conversation we're going to be keeping in touch and keeping our eyes on all of the things that you guys are up to in the months and years to come thank you very much for being a part thank of you. our webinar today thanks thank a lot, you.